Thank you very much for a great introduction. It's a pleasure. I enjoyed very much this meeting with a lot of discussion. I focus on two main uh, uh, issues today, which are a bit uh, relatively new. Uh, one is mechanical power, and the second one is uh, the role of transformary pressure. So that I think we can discuss all together. No conflict of interest. Uh, these are the uh, main mechanisms for ventilator-induced lung injury, which is high pressure, uh, high tidal volume, or resting volume at end expiration and uh, cyclic reopening. And we know that there are different factors that may induce ventilator-induced lung injury, which are tidal volume, plateau pressure, driving pressure of the rest of the system of all the lung, the positive end expiratory <laughs> pressure. But other factors have been less considered, like respiratory rate, which is associated with different inspiratory flow, and all of them may promote uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. And this is why the concept of energy delivered by the ventilator to the lung, or the power, mechanical power delivered from the ventilator to the lung, mm -hmm. has been raised in these last years. So we are moving from the concept of barotrauma to volotrauma to atelic trauma to ergo trauma. What is mechanical power in joule per minute is the rate at which work, so the energy in joule is done. And so we are talking about the mechanical ventilation and dissipation of energy when inspiratory energy is higher than expiratory energy. We have heat or inflammation in the lung and this may be associated with ventilator-induced lung injury. So what is the energy that we are delivering with the ventilator? This is a, a graph showing the volume and the pressure. This is the volume that you get, get gain with the PIP, and we don't consider here. And we, this is the volume of the tidal volume during breath. This is the level of PIP that we are applying, so this rectangular area is the energy given by the ventilator by the PIP in a static condition. We don't consider this triangle because we don't know in clinical practice how much is the volume that you get with the PIP above the residual volume. But anyway, this is a minimal amount of energy that you are giving to the lung. Then this is the static energy, this is the plateau pressure, this is the PIP, so this is the driving pressure. And that this triangle is the energy that you are delivering during the tidal breath. And the difference here between plateau pressure and peak, so this trapezoid here, is the resistive energy that you are delivering to the lung and especially to peripheral arteries. So if you know the pressure and you know the tidal volume, independently from the level of PIP, you can measure the energy delivered by the ventilator. So the area is the rectangular trapezoid, and you, as you know from the high school, the area is the major base, so the peak uh, plus major base, so the peak pressure, because it's the peak pressure and zip here, even if you have PIP here, so this is basal, major plus the minor basal, which is A, which is the PIP, plus the resistive component, times tidal volume, which is the height, divided two. So big base, at least we say in Italy, the trapezoid area is the big base, plus the minor base, uh, times the height, which is tidal volume, divided two. Okay? You can follow and if you, if you develop this equation, you have two times peak minus driving pressure, tidal volume divided two, which can be rewritten as two times peak pressure minus driving pressure divided two tidal volume, which again can be written easily, peak pressure minus driving pressure divided two times tidal volume. So this is the energy, tidal volume, times the peak minus driving pressure divided two, times 0098, which is a constant uh, to move, uh, to convert from centimeter of water and milliliter to joule, okay? Is a constant for... 
So this is the factor of energy, tidal volume in liter, peak and driving pressure in centimeter of water. Okay, this is the energy delivered to the lung for each breath in control mechanical ventilation, in volume control. In pressure control, the formula is a bit different, but the calculation is very similar. So, uh, now we make some example. We have a, a patient with a tidal volume of 0 0.5 liters, so 500, peak pressure 30, driving pressure 15, so you can make the calculation, means that every breath has one joule per breath, okay? Why this number? Because 500 is more or less protective tidal volume, 30 is the peak pressure, maximum, no? Usually it's equivalent to 26, 27 plateau pressure, and this is the maximum driving pressure. So at the maximum protective ventilation, one breath is one joule. If you want to calculate the power, you have to to multiply the energy per breath times the number of breath. So if 15 breath will be equivalent to 16 times 6 joule per minute, if this 30 breaths will be 33.3. So you see that the, the, the rest of your rate play a major role in the amount of power that you are giving to the lung. Then now we look at what happens when we are protectively ventilating a lung with low tidal volume, respiratory rate 24, relatively low PEEP at 10, plateau pressure very protective 25, and driving pressure around 15, okay, which is the maximum. If you calculate, this is equivalent to 16 times 4 joule per minute, okay? Now we look what happens when we increase the tidal volume. When we increase the tidal volume, and I reduced here the respiratory rate at 12 in order to keep the minute ventilation constant, the same PEEP level, but the plateau pressure increases because we are increasing the tidal volume, and the driving pressure is increasing. And look at that. Now, mechanical power, even if respiratory rate is lower, even if respiratory rate is lower, is almost double. So that's why we have not to ventilate our patient with high tidal volume. And the second message is high driving pressure is bad when it's associated with an increasing tidal volume. First message today for me. High driving pressure is associated with mortality. But this does not mean that if we reduce driving pressure, the patients go better. I will show you. It. This just means that if we increase tidal volume and driving pressure, of course, increases, this is bad for the energy that we are empowered, that we are delivering to the lung. Then we give you another example, that lower plateau pressure is much more important than to reduce the driving pressure if you increase the plateau pressure. Look at that. Now you have a case with low PEEP, relatively low PEEP 11, plateau pressure 25, very high driving pressure, which is within the limit, at 0.5, and 20 respiratory rate. You have 17.6. Now, we increase the people. I just put 22. We can put 20. So the people who love to have very high PEEP, okay? And we increase not too much the plateau pressure within the limit at 30. And we might markedly decrease the driving pressure. And we are happy. That's correct? We are happy because we put the PEEP high and driving pressure decreased. Compliance improved. So the patience is better. Hmm, I don't know. Because if you look, if you keep the same respiratory rate, look, just the increase in peak pressure, which is this plateau pressure, even if you reduce markedly the driving pressure, you have much more energy and much more power to the lung. So that means that if you reduce the driving pressure by increasing the PEEP, but you increase even not too much the plateau pressure or the peak pressure, this may be associated with a major increase in the mechanical power and energy. So this means that if you apply the PEEP and you improve the compliance, this can, can be worse for the patient. Can be worse for the patient. I don't believe anymore, and I will show you also clinical data, that if you set the PEEP according to the best driving pressure, this is the best for the patient. This is, and this data, theoretical data, absolutely explain why is the case. It's good if it is driving pressure is high because you are delivering high tidal volume. 
That's why we have to reduce tidal volume. So driving pressure is very important to target the tidal volume. If at six or seven meters per kilogram either body weight, driving pressure is higher than 15, we should reduce the tidal volume. But this is not the same if you reduce the driving pressure by optimizing the PIP. This, I think, is a very important concept. So be aware of the plateau pressure, which is play a major role in the energy that you are giving. Keep the plateau pressure as low as, as possible. Lower driving pressure impacts mechanical power and energy when associated with a reduced tidal volume and not when you are setting the best PIP. And this is a study in animals when we deliver energy and power, the minimal power, so at low tidal volume and lower respiratory rate as possible. Then at this minimal mechanical power, we increase the tidal volume. So the concept is, if the theory is that only mechanical power per se is associated with lung injury, we should expect the same lung injury for the same mechanical power. That's right. We are delivering the minimal mechanical power, but with different tidal volumes. And of course, here we are reducing the respiratory rate. And look at that. We had a progressive increase in lung injury. So this means that even at lowest mechanical power, you should deliver the lowest mechanical power with the lowest tidal volume as possible and the lowest driving power as possible. If you deliver the lowest mechanical power with the higher driving pressure or higher tidal volume, you don't get the positive effects. So again, the lowest tidal volume and the lowest driving pressure and the lowest plateau pressure are the best combination in our uh, uh, condition. And we did another study with lower power or higher power with low tidal volume or high tidal volume. Of, you see here, if you deliver the low tidal volume but you increase the respiratory rate here, you have more damage. So you have to minimize the respiratory rate in order to achieve, for example, a pH higher than 7.25, if you can. But if you deliver high tidal volume, if a low power, you see you have an increase in the damage, as I show you in the other study. Of course, if you combine high tidal volume and high respiratory rate, you have the worst effects. But again, tidal volume is crucial, but is not the only factor, because you see here, if you need to increase too much the respiratory rate, you increase the power, and even low tidal volume may damage the lung. There are some data, these are not randomized data, but are clinical data. This is the first study we performed on more than 8,000 patients, mainly non-RDS patients. We calculated mechanical power according to the formula that I showed you. And you see, we found that when mechanical power was higher than 17, there was an association, again, this is not randomized, just an association with mortality. And this, interestingly, this is what because was caused by higher tidal volume and driving pressure. And even when higher mechanical power here was due to low tidal volume and low driving pressure, but likely high respiratory rate, we have an increase in, in mortality. So it's not enough to reduce tidal volume and, and, and driving pressure. This should be associated with the minimal respiratory rate as acceptable for the patient. And interestingly, we had uh, almost 20% of patients who developed RDS. And in this patient, mechanical power was associated independently on mortality, even in RDS, and, with, and without the presence of neuromuscular blockade. So in non-RDS, we found that the mechanical power threshold in terms of risk of death was around 70 to 20 joules per minute. Another very recent study from China, a big population of patients with RDS. You see here, they, they uh, normalized mechanical power with the predicted body weight, and I transfer here with joules per minute. And this is the... On, standardized for predicted body weight. And you see in the mild, they did not find relationship, but they found a constant relationship with severe or moderate RDS. And you see when you have more than 17 or 20, more and more and more, higher is the risk. So a little bit different compared to our study. Our study showed that even in mild or non-RDS patients, we had an increase in mortality when the threshold were higher than 17. But in severe and moderate, it seems to be 
even stronger the relation between mechanical power and mortality. And these are very nice data from Quintel and Gattinoni. Uh, look at this, this is the lifeguards. It's very recently published on Blue Journal. These are patients undergoing ECMO and they look at mechanical ventilation. Uh, and you see here in the non-ECMO and during ECMO. In this big study, this is not randomized, but they found that during ECMO, there was a major reduction in the power of mechanical ventilation. This is I transferred these variables in joule per minute. You see that before ECMO was around 27. During ECMO was around uh, 10 joule per minute. And this was the Eolia that was discussed this morning. Before the study, it was uh, above or around 27 joule per minute. During ECMO, just uh, around 10 joule per minute. And the same in another very recent study published observational. So all this study on ECMO, mechanical power was very high, higher than 25. And was a major reduction in mechanical power when ECMO was delivered. So in general, I believe that we can consider this variable in the future. Of course, we, have, we have need more knowledge. But in OR, we should keep mechanical power below 12 joule per minute. In mild RDS, below 17 joule per minute. In moderate RDS, below 22 joule per minute. In severe RDS, below 27 joule per minute. And perhaps this might be a very interesting parameter to start to think about ECMO. If joule per minute are more than 27, probably we have to start to think about ECMO. So this is the first message that uh, I wanted to give you today. Of course, these are not randomized data, randomized data, but it's something new and can give you an overall picture when you are at the bedside on the different components of possible uh, factors inducing uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. So this is what uh, is my view, our view on uh, uh, how we treat RDS in patients with PO2 FO2 higher than 150. These patients, we always try, if possible, non-invasive ventilation. But we intubate immediately these patients if tidal volume in positive pressure is higher than 10 ml per kilogram predicted body weight. For us, tidal volume, higher tidal volume, and increasing respiratory rate are the two main factors to intubate patients early. And then, if they are intubated, we start with assisted ventilation immediately with a PIP level between 5 to 10 centimeters of water. In patients with PO2 effort ratio less than 150, of course, we start with low tidal volume, and we adapt tidal volume even lower if driving pressure has to be maintained below 13. So if with 6, driving pressure is above 15, we further reduce tidal volume. That's why driving pressure is important, not to set PIP but to optimize tidal volume. This is my view, which is different from what is commonly believed. Minimal respiratory rate to maintain a pH higher than 7.25 or 7.2, I would say. Low plateau pressure as much as we can, so this means that we are to reduce the PEEP, we will discuss later. Low driving pressure according to the optimization of tidal volume. The minimal PIP between 11 to 15, according to the minimal saturation, so not the minimal driving pressure, but we will be for further discussion, and recruit maneuver and stepwise only as a rescue. Mechanical power, as I show you, below 27 in more severe RDS, and if higher, we start to think about ECMO. Prone position, prone position always in these patients, that's why it was in the in the slide, for at least 12 hours a day. Neuromuscular blockade agents, not mandatory. Very often in prone position, we need them with increased sedation, but we try to reduce as much as possible, especially from the last study. And ECMO, if six hours with PO2 FO2 ratio less than 80, mechanical power above 27, and our pH uh, below 7.2, 7.2.5, or pc 2 higher than 60. So this is how we treat RDS. So now we can uh, 
and we can discuss after this. I think I tried to, I was asked to give a very clinical concept. I hope that I give you my, our, our team interpretation of mechanical ventilation, very easy. So now we go to another very exciting topic, which is transpulmonary pressure. Do we need, don't we need? So why we don't measure transpulmonary pressure? This is from Bellani's study. Is of the pressure is measured in less than 1% of mechanical ventilated patients. These are the facts. So we are very disappointed. Why? Because measuring and interpreting esophageal and transforming pressure is very complicated. And I will discuss a little bit about that. So two big uh, reviews, a nice review that I suggest you. This is the first we published in 2014. And then there is another one by Maori published in 2016. So for those of you who want to have more information, these are things to landmark reviews on this topic. While esophageal pressure and transponering may be useful in, to partition restroom mechanics, to assess lung recruitability or guide recruitment maneuver, to assess the optimize the level of PEEP and tidal volume inspiratory pressure in passive condition, and we will discuss just these three items, and in spontaneous ventilation to detect better the reverse triggering or transponding pressure, we will discuss a little bit on that, work of breathing and patient ventilator synchrony. We don't discuss in detail these issues today. So to measure esophageal pressure, you know we need uh, uh, some device with a balloon or without a balloon uh, to measure the pressure in the esophagus, and the esophagus is here, which is near to the pleura, so it's supposed to measure something related to the pleural pressure. But from this slide, you see that we are measuring in this, at this level of the lung. So the question is, what are we really measuring? We have the heart above, we have the lung above that, and we are measuring at this level, which can be different here or different here. So this is important to exactly understand in supine position. In the early studies, esophageal pressure was measured upright from millichemini, the physiologist, was a completely different issue. We have normal subjects spontaneously breathing in upright position. Now we have disease patients in control mechanic, in mechanical ventilation, in supine position, and the lung is completely different from the normal one. So we're talking about another world. We cannot transfer physiology from one side to another. Some technical consideration. We, patients should stay in the semi-recumbent position, never measure that in supine position. You have to retrieve, the, how to manage the feeding tube is another issue because you have two catheters if you have an additional catheter. We don't know when the experimental by Milich and uh, the McKinsey uh, in, you know, in, uh, in Montreal, completely different situation. Only the esophageal balloon, not nasogastric esophageal balloon and then some, uh, the Nava catheter, I mean, <laughs> or other catheters in the esophagus. Uh, we have to insert a dedicated catheter. Usually we put at the lower third of the esophagus, but I showed you that this is not, the, is not only the problem. The problem is which pressure from the sternum to the vertebra. The lower third is from the apex to the diaphragm, but then we have to sternum to the vertebra. And we are used to inflate 0 0.5 to milliliter. It depends on the catheter. So now a very nice study from Francesco Moioli in Italy. Here you have different catheters, no? Always with a balloon. And here you see the compliance of the catheter, and this is the level uh, performing a different level of pressure. So lower level of PEEP or higher level of PEEP, okay? First of all, you see that the amount of volume at which you have a flat curve, so it means that the pressure does not change with the inflation volume of the balloon, it changes dramatically from one to two milliliter for each catheter. So each catheter has a different compliance of the balloon, which is a problem, okay? Because you get completely different measurements. And then you have an effect of this curve, calibration curve, according to the PIP, so the external PIP that you are applying. So not easy. And this is a nice study from Francesco Moioli. 
they did that and inspiration and expiration this is the the pressure that they measure according to different volume you see how it's changing the esophageal pressure when you inflate different increasing the inflate the, 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 the balloon can you imagine if you inflate this you have five if you inflate this you have ten and then we want to measure the tr absolute transformative pressure what we are talking about it's better to measure to put the people or the pressure on the ventilator or this the, the ROE pressure is the ROE pressure here we are talking about numbers at the lottery okay they suggest to go to the best volume here and in fact they found that if you go to the best the dive, the difference between the the, the difference in pre esophageal pressure and airway pressure it should be around one no at the occlusion pressure is the best but you know this means that for each balloon you have to calibrate in each patient mm, very difficult very difficult can you imagine a large randomized trial with that mm. or in the night or i mean in my busy icu with uh, 35 beds and trauma coming, uh, cardiac arrest, uh, intra-abdominal balloon, uh, consultants, uh, and then we measure the calibration of the esophageal pressure of the balloon for one time, because we don't know what happens after one hour. Now there is a new catheter, for example, developed, which is very nice, I like, is a, is a nutritional catheter with an esophageal and uh, um, gastric balloon. So you, you, you need at least only one catheter. Uh, the, this is quite, it's not so large, so it means that the patient has not to be, you know, have, um, drainage from the stomach, so only for nutrition. It's something that, for example, we use in the post-operative in some condition, but anyway, it's more expensive than, uh, than a, a conventional nasogastric tube. So, I mean, some problems also from this point of view, but these are, uh, uh, a new uh, technological advice. Um, this is a study we did with Marcelo De Breu some years ago, and we compared the air filled with liquid filled with the balloon catheter. And look at that with the balloon catheter, how much is the uh, heart uh, uh, influence on the signal? Well, much less with the air filled or liquid filled. So, and the, the, the data were very similar. So what I mean is that perhaps the balloon, balloon is not the best way, but while the air or liquid filled simple catheter might be easier, much less expensive, and less uh, influenced by the uh, uh, cardiac oscillation. So you see also from technological point of view, you can have a lot of, of developments. We believe that only the balloon catheter is, uh, is, is, the, is the standard. Uh, then we can measure the height of the patient times 0.2, and then usually this is the, to calculate the length at which we have to put the catheter on the third, the best cardiac oscillation. I show you that it depends on the device, and we should perform the occlusion test. So you see here what we showed that you have the patient has to be put the catheter in the gastric here stomach if you are able to do then the balloons here you see the esophageal pressure when you move up the catheter then it depends if you have double balloon of course it's different and then at a certain point uh, you see here that you have a tracing uh, that seems to be uh, uh, um, quite acceptable, and especially when in line with the gastric. So you see here when you have increasing pressure, decrease in the uh, esophageal pressure, inspiratory effort, and then increase in the stomach. Of course, when the patient is not having expiratory activity, because the patient's expiratory activity is even more complicated. This is the occlusion test during you occlude the arrays, you occlude the arrays, the patient is spontaneously breathing. And in blue, you have the esophageal pressure. In red is the airway pressure. And if you assume that the balloon is correctly positioned at the occlusion, you have no change in volume. That's correct. So the transformative pressure should not change. Do you follow me? You are occluded. 
no change in volume, no change in transformer pressure. So it means that the chain, the swings in esophageal pressure should be exactly the same of the swings in the airway pressure. Or at least within 10%. If you are in control mechanical ventilation, what you have to do, you have to occlude the airways, attend the expiration, and to gently push on the thorax, you increase the pressure in the, in the airways here. You are at the occlusion here. This is the conventional breath. You occlude the airways. You push gently on the thorax. And then you see the artificial increase in the airways and the artificial increase in the esophageal pressure. And again, they should be very similar. These are the two methods to uh, get information if the balloon is correctly positioned or not. But again, it's for that moment. It's for research. Because it's after two hours, the patient is moving, or the nurses, or whatever. You don't know anymore what's going on. OK? The balloon has to be recalibrated. The maneuver is to be redone, very complicated. And you see here, this is the is changes in esophageal pressure and the repression in spontaneous breathing at the occlusion or during inspiratory effort at the compression of the chest during occlusion. And you see this is the curve that you would expect between changes in esophageal pressure and airway pressure, which should be uh, more or less the same within 10%. This is the occlusion method. Is it clear? Hmm? Now, what we did was, even many years ago, was to measure the pleural pressure within the thorax with the wafers. And now we did in Dresden with thoraco thoracotomy. So very, very sophisticated technique as compared to what uh, we did uh, with John Marini years ago in docs where we have to open the chest at that time. And these are the data in control mechanical ventilation. You see here, this is the pleural pressure. This is the esophageal pressure. This is inspiratory, this is expiratory. This is the dependent lung, this is non-dependent lung. First of all, look at the dependent, non-dependent lung, expiratory. You see here, you have pleural pressure is zero, pleural pressure directly measured with uh, wafers, I mean, with the probes, okay? It's the real pressure in the pleura is zero, and the esophageal pressure is six, okay? And it's the same here in the inspira inspiration and inspiration. So first message, the pressure of esophageal pressure does not represent the absolute value at end inspiration in the dependent lung, okay? Then we look at the, no, I'm sorry, in the non-dependent. We look at the, the dependent. Again, you see here, you have 10 of pleural pressure, and you have six in esophageal pressure. Much more in the esophageal pressure than the real regional pressure. Four, five centimeters of water. What we are talking about. On average, in the middle, yes. More or less in the middle. The pleural pressure in the middle, because the esophageal catheter, you remember the CT scan, is exactly in the middle of the chest, represents more or less the regional pleural pressure. In the middle, but you have a regional distribution. And this is why the vertical gradient of the pressure here is uh, equivalent to the gradient of the superimposed pressure. So higher is the weight of the lung due to the edema, higher is the increase in the gradient in the pleural pressure. So this is an additional variable that you have. But what we are measuring by esophageal pressure is the pressure, more or less, in the middle of the lung. Now there are new data in three cadavers. So I mean, very limited. Uh, and you see again, this is the expiratory transformer pressure directly measured and the PEEP level. And you see that, again, they also found that in non-dependent, Compared to the dependent, you see that the transformy pressure is negative, so pleural pressure is positive here and here. And there is, in the, the middle, the esophageal represent, again, is, in the, is the middle, even in the cadavers. 
So exactly our data reproduced. But you see how much difference between non-dependent and the dependent regions. We are talking about five, six centimeters of water difference in terms of absolute. When they look at the inspiratory transformary, it was exactly the same. So you see here the non-dependent sensor, much higher transformary as compared to the dependent sensor. So means that, again, in inspiration, there are not uh, uh, correlation between the esophageal pressure and the real regional pressure. There are two methods, one met different methods to measure. The one is proposed by Talmor, which is the absolute difference. For example, here, you have transforming pressure attend inspiration is three, transforming pressure attend inspiration is six. Or here they added PEEP and you have 12 attend inspiration and four attend inspiration. This is very easy. So you measure the ROE pressure, you measure the esophageal pressure, and you make the difference between the ROE pressure and the esophageal pressure. So you assume that the esophageal pressure is the equivalent of the pleural pressure. But I showed you that this is not the truth. This is just the average pressure, but not the regional one. Then there are two other methods. One is the elastance-derived measurement. How it is? This is a control mechanical ventilation, you see, and this is esophagus. You go from plateau pressure of 22 and PEEP of 6. This is an example. Driving pressure of 16, tidal volume 600. And this is the esophageal pressure. Attend inspiration and then expiration, 20 and 17. Difference, 3, okay? Now, if we measure the absolute difference is 22 minus 20. So means plus two. Do you agree? Talmor would, would measure like this, okay? Attend expiration is six minus 17 is minus 11, okay? Means that you have, at this point, Talmor would put uh, uh, 15 of people to counterbalance this negative transformative pressure. Means that the esophageal pressure is higher than the pressure uh, in the lung, and this should cause the collapse, okay? Now, one hypothesis is to measure, to estimate the pressure as a plateau pressure, or PEEP, times the elastance of the lung divided the total elastance. This is in order to estimate a possible transformative pressure corrected for the individual patient. If you do like this, you have I made the calculation, so the last loss of the lung is 26, of the rest of the is 32, so the ratio is 0 0.8. So you have 22 times 0 0.8, means that with the elastance derived, the transformative pressure attend inspiration should be 17.6, which is completely different from the transformative pressure measured by the absolute numbers. And if you look at the PEEP, at the expiration, is the same. You have 6, so the PEEP 6 times 0 0.8 is 5, which is completely different from minus 11. Is it clear? So if you measure by the elastance derived, you have other numbers compared to the absolute. Mm. And we don't like the, this method. We like the released derived method. It's another method proposed. Here, you have the occlusion attend inspiration at PEEP, and then you have to go to ZIP. So you standardize for the change in pressure from a PEEP level to ZIP. And this is the numbers for the esophageal pressure. So again, absolute difference here is 13, 30 minus 12. So the transformative pressure here is plus 18. Do you agree? Attend expiration is 10 minus 9, so is 1. Okay? Now, how is calculated the release derived method? It's calculated like 30 minus zip, minus zip, 
minus 12 minus 16. So the major change in transformer pressure. So this means that you have around 24 centimeters of water. That compared to 18 is very different. If you look at PIP, it's 10 minus 0 minus 9 minus 6. So means 7 centimeters of water, which is completely different from 1. So even for the release method, there is no correlation. So whatever you do, you have different numbers. I don't like that. And in fact, if you compare the last stance derived with the Talmor absolute, and this is the best PIP according to the end expiration. I, I showed you that is the case for inspiration and expiration, whatever you want. You see that there is no correlation. You can put the PIP by random or better. You put the PIP on PO2 FR2 table, believe me, it's much better. So no correlation. And then, uh, then Cumello here, they compare the elastance and the release method. And you see that the difference in terms of, uh, this was transforming pressure is around uh, plus minus two centimeter water at low PIP and that P15 plus minus four centimeter water. So it's higher the error that you have by this measurement than to set PIP with whatever other measurement uh, system, in my opinion. So then we have other problems. If you have a chest tube, what, we, what should we do? The natural gas tube we discussed, the effect of pleural effusion is another issue. When you have one lung injury and prone position was discussed today. I measure esophageal pressure in supine and prone, but we have a problem because when we turn the patient prone, this effect is completely reversed. So even the absolute numbers are completely uh, without any relationship with what you are doing. We found that those patients who decreased the chest wall compliance had better oxygenation in prone. And we say, ah, wow, yes, because there were changes in regional compliance. Probably it was not like that, but this I, I was thinking after, year after. Because when you are in supine position, when you are in supine position, uh, you, you, you have the effect of the mediastinum. When you are prone, you have less effect on mediastinum. So those patients that likely recruited, they are more ventilated, so they have more exchange in pleural pressure because you are ventilated. And so we found that like a reduction in chest wall compliance. But probably it was not a reduction in chest wall compliance. My study should be reinterpreted. My study in 2000 is very much quoted, but probably people that didn't, know, I even did not believe at that time. I did not understand at the time. Probably it was just because those patients recruited and they improved oxygenation, not because the chest wall changed. Because there were more aeration here, and so you have more swing in the esophageal pressure which is nothing to do with chest wall compliance. <laughs> so many difficulties, the dark side, you see here, many source of error, many problems related to the absolute values. And then we have also some contraindication, but these are the, and the regional variation. So we can skip these slides. This is just, uh, to give you some uh, advice, uh, this is the chest wall elastance and this is the intraabdominal pressure. You see the chest wall elastance usually is higher when intraabdominal pressure is higher than 20 meters. <laughs> One suggestion that we proposed to correct the, the pressure for the intraabdominal pressure is the following. You have pressure, PEEP or inspiratory pressure. Pressure target, intraabdominal pressure, minus 13, why minus 13 in centimeter of water? because it's the average pressure of mechanically ventilated patients. Divided to Y2 because half of the pressure in the abdomen is transferred in the pleura. So if you have a target of 27, for example, of plateau pressure, you, and you have an intraabdominal pressure of 21, you can correct this measure very easily, 21 minus 13 divided 2, so means 27 plus 8 divided 2, so means 27 plus 4, 31. 
So it means that you have, if you have an intra-abdominal pressure of 21 centimeter water, or equivalent of 15 millimeter of mercury, you should correct, uh, if you want to get the same level of transponding pressure, for four cent five centimeter of water higher in airway pressure. Is it clear? In an obese patient, you can accept for the same level of safety, four to five centimeters of water higher in the airway pressure without measuring any, airway pre uh, any esophageal pressure. Just very easy bedside correction. Uh, spontaneous breathing, uh, just one, two slides. Do you see here, this is pressure support. This is the esophageal pressure. This is true. In spontaneous breathing, the transpulmonary pressure, you don't see the transpulmonary pressure during the airway pressure because you don't see this negative part. So if the effort is too high, if you don't measure esophageal pressure, you don't have any information about the effort of the patient. I could say, yes, you measure the PO1. If the PO1 is higher than three or four, means that the instrument effort is too high and you should correct for that. I like very much PO1. We should go back to the PO1. And again, this is from Amato. You see here is the pleural pressure in the non-dependent. This is in the dependent. And this is the esophageal pressure. Look at that. In the dependent region, minus 10 of swing. Esophageal pressure, minus 3, minus 4. And in the upper, minus 4. So even when you measure during assisted ventilation, you see here, you underestimate with esophageal pressure what's happening in the more caudal areas of the, of the pleura. Uh, okay, just a few cases in, in, in uh, patients. Why we should not rely too much in this? This is in obese patients, uh, American group from Boston. And they look at, at the obese patients and you see what they found, that in order to achieve a transformative pressure, a 10 expiration, positive, in order to avoid atelectasis, in obese patients undergoing surgery, PIP was need to be applied, PIP of 20, to have a transponary pressure positive. But I show you that we are talking about uh, uh, lottery numbers. And in fact, when we reproduced the same in obese patients, and we look at the PIP by using the AT, so what really happens in the lung, you see that we found some dispersion in the best PIP by AT in obese patients, but around 12 centimeters of water, not 20. So it means that to set PIP according to the transplant pressure gives you, I don't know if numbers, the setting of PIP without any sense. If you compare with the AT, which at least you, you, you visualize what you going on to the lung. And then these are the data in patients with surgery. I suggest you, if you have not opportunity, look at JAMA, published on June 3, the largest study ever done. I think also Iran is here. We were at the ESA, we, we, we showed this data uh, uh, in the ProBASE trial, more than 2,000 patients randomized, higher PEEP 12 versus four of PEEP. As, it's also combined with the ProVilo trial, another trial from our team, 900 patients, non obese patients, no difference in Outcome, no difference of outcome, but more hypotension, more bradycardia, more vasoactive drug. With a little bit higher need of rescue desaturation, but just increasing the FL2. So it means that why to apply 20 of PIP according to the transformative pressure? If just with 12, you have a much more negative hemodynamic effects and to, and to correct the desaturation, is just enough to increase the FL2 from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. So don't use a high PIP in a base patient during surgery. Just increase the FL2. If you, just in a very few patients, you have to increase PIP higher than five. And if you have more details, you can have a look at the paper. So by using this, uh, without any transponary pressure, just by using the logic, uh, one of two, five patients with high hypertension, 
One on 10 without vasectomy drug, one on 10 need increase, a little bit increase of 10% FR2. So on 320 million operation in Europe, we can save more, almost uh, 100 million patients without vasoactive drugs and hypotension by using our technique. And in obese patients from IFSO 2018, we can save almost every year uh, 120,000 patients without hypotension due to the PIP and the vasoactive drugs. This, I think, why randomized trials are also important. Uh, okay, just a uh, uh, last uh, for two minutes on uh, RDS. In operating room, in non-thoracic surgery, non-cardiovascular surgery, pro trial, pro trial, the two largest trial, no PIP higher than five. Tidal volume, seven meter per kg predicted body weight, no recruiting maneuver. This is the rules, very simple rules, from Provenet investigators, from randomized trials. Now we look at the RDS. This is a very nice study from Cumello. They said the people with different methods, this is the PO2 FR2 table. And you see that you have higher PIP, higher but not higher than 15, in more recruitable patients, and less PIP in less recruitable. I like that. Oxygenation. But look at this. If you look at the best driving pressure, you have exactly the same. You have, you have the opposite effects. Higher PIP in less recruitable, lower PIP in, in more recruitable. So don't set the PIP according to the best driving pressure. The driving pressure is only useful to optimize the tidal volume, not the PIP. You have the opposite effects. If you the stress index the same, if you use the esophageal pressure, esophageal pressure is no 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 real value. So in fact, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Okay, it's even worse than this. At least here you know that you are worse. Here you don't know because uh, it's, a, it's a lottery number. So this is my suggestion again that will be discussed later. Minimal PIP for minimal oxygenation, the best way to set PIP. Not transferring pressure, not driving pressure. Uh, this is the study that was uh, commented before. I think that the major issue here is that they compared with the uh, higher PIP group of NIH table. I would have compared with the lower PIP. But if you remember the NIH trial, you can compare high versus low, no difference. So I would expect no difference. So the consequence, don't use esophageal pressure. Too complicated. Use the low PIP if you're too table. Uh, so close the lung. This will be discussed later very easily. Just gently ventilate the aerated lung and keep the atelectasis at rest with minimal tidal volume and minimal driving pressure and minimal P for minimal oxygenation. So the conclusion are the restroom mechanics and perhaps lung mechanics, but we, I show you that it's very difficult to partition and to interpret data. May help to optimize mechanical ventilation, tidal volume, plateau pressure, diving pressure, PIP and respiratory. And respiratory, respiratory is the key at the moment. Mechanical power may be a potential new parameter to optimize ventilator setting from operating room to RDS. I gave you some threshold. Of course, this is not randomized trial, but interesting data. Esophageal and transformative pressure are very advanced monitoring with many potential applications, but I show you that we need much better knowledge in terms of technology and interpretation of data. I just show you clear example that whatever you measure, you can get different data. So how can you set mechanical ventilation in something that is not reliable at the moment? Of course, we need more evidence for mechanical power and esophageal pressure and transformative pressure to optimize mechanical ventilation before any clinical application uh, of these uh, techniques at the bedside. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I mean, it was an exceptional lecture. I think two major areas, mechanical power and transpulmonary pressure. So I think any questions that we start discussing uh, the talk? Yes. Hello.
Hello there. Thank you so much. I just wondered, the um, animal models from your group, were they lung injury models? All of them? Yes, they yes, yes. Normal yes, yes. The, uh, our model was lung injury, lung injury with oleic acid. And they reproduce more or less the same in the study by Yamato in control mechanical okay. ventilation. Uh, so uh, we know now that the esophageal pressure does not represent uh, the dependent lung region. So how can you set the PEEP, for example, yeah. on that? Uh, we know that it's more likely in control mechanical ventilation, even in lung injury, uh, with the average level of pressure. Okay, we can accept that, uh, but it's not the dependence, so it's nothing to do with uh, the atelectasis. Sure. My only other part so what, what I think is sorry. that if there is some possible application, is the difference between inspiration and expiration, so the delta. But uh, so what? Yeah. My, sorry, my only other question was about my, a group, subgroup of patients, which are the spinal injured patients, who generally the approach is, again, mm. anecdotal, not evidence-based, it's retrospective data, but the approach is large volume ventilation to reduce atelectasis and encourage. So my only question was your comment on that approach. So spina, spina, we're talking about spina. Spine. So, or, or whatever, also neuro patients, uh, other. I mean, uh, uh, we did not discuss in this day, in this uh, um, uh, event, a uh, symposium, uh, the non RDS patients. What we know now, we, we published just in October the PREVENT trial on JAMA, uh, 1,000 patients. Uh, we compared uh, uh, 10, and it was not more than 10 because. Uh, uh, of course, we have to follow the rules. We try not, but within the limits. And compare with six, what we found was that in non-RDS patients, uh, you can start with low tidal volume, but if you can allow assisted ventilation with less sedation, up to 10 milliliters per kilogram, there was no effect in terms of outcome, but uh, there was less acidosis, less hypercapnia, uh, and even uh, less ventilator free days in those groups who were intubated in intensive care. So, uh, probably in non RDS patients, if we can allow more spontaneous breathing, we have to follow the patient and allow a little bit higher tidal volume. And curiously, in our study, we had some patients that no RDS because they were hypoxemic, so POTF2 was less than 200, but 20% of the patients on 2000 but was not formally RDS because there were no bilateral injury, even in those patients, but was not powerful for that, there was positive effects of higher tidal volume within that limit, but these are non areas. So I think that in this patient, we can likely to allow a little bit higher tidal volume, but what about PIP? Uh, we have uh, um, some meta-analysis that we did, nine, eight versus less than five, no difference, but uh, we have relaxed trial, I was uh, discussing with uh, Luigi, is uh, just to be completed, I think, for the end of the year, 1,000 almost uh, patients randomized, known RDS, eight of PIP versus less than five as a prophylactic, and we will see the results. And I think we can give uh, the final answer on how to ventilate non RDS. So coming to your question, in this patient, I would be, if needed, a little bit higher tidal volume, up to 10 and not exceeding 20 of, of plateau pressure and PIP of five, maximum seven, but not used too much PIP in these patients. And I would use recruitment only as a rescue if you need. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other questions, Jonathan? The subject of um, transformative pressure seems intuitively uh, the, uh, an appropriate thing to, to look at. How do you think we can do meaningful studies, at least currently, um, international studies, over a thousand patients, when you've eloquently shown what a load of rubbish uh, trans uh, pulmonary pressure is? 
Yes, that's my point. That I think that uh, actually I would not be I would not suggest if my conclusion here. Of course, other people can have different ideas. I know that there is some people. I, I, I can tell you that probably I was one of the first uh, to measure the algebra with very very tricky methods in the ninety four. I, I, I so I I was in favor. I, I am also I like I measure. If you look in ninety five, we published the first paper on RDS patients. The uh, the partition. So I love that. And I also, I think I'm one of the few who measured transforming pressure in obese patients during anesthesia, laparoscopy, and so on. So he's talking a person that uh, started to measure the transforming pressure in the 94, okay, with Bicor and so on. But now, from what we know, I think that uh, we have to understand much more and to standardize much more what we are measuring. Because as I show you, whatever you measure, you can get different numbers. So it's impossible to me, actually, if you think to plan a study on that, you can test on end expiration, both. End inspiration, both. Uh, driving pressure, you don't know. So, we, or at least to decide something, but I think that if we plan now a study, a big study, the probability to have a chance to get a positive result is almost equivalent to zero. And my fear is that if we use this technique, because now I, ah, more severe patients, we have to use this. Why? The risk to me is that you increase, we don't know how to set the PIP by ROE pressure. But I think that with esophageal pressure, as I tried to demonstrate to you today, we can even more error than the conventional. This does not mean that for research purposes, to understand better a little bit or uh, what's going on. This may be a technique that may be applied, but I would reserve actually this technique only for research and very specific uh, physiological study. This is my conclusion today. Of course, other people may be in contrast, like people that they like higher PIP in anesthesia. We have the data, we like the randomized trial, big data, and I think that the data make the difference.